on today. This is out of an XR200, and this is a very common problem that a lot of motorcycle enthusiasts have. The spline on your shifter fork goes, or the spline on your kickstart goes. And in today's video, we're gonna take you through all of the steps that I take to fix this up and get this guy back on the road. Lucky for me, there's not too much assembly that goes into this. So all I have to do is slide this spring off and then we can throw it in the lathe. And even better, because this part, I don't want it spinning in the lathe, it's actually gonna kind of act a little bit like a drive dog. So I can kind of fit it in there and then I'll push it up against the side that's gonna have the torsion and it's gonna work out quite well. Now, I'm probably about four or five thou out here, but really, to be honest, it's probably already bent from the bike crashing a few times. So we're just gonna bring it back to zero, roughly wherever it is. See, there's no bearings lining up. It's just a shifter fork. And <laughs> to be honest, some of the people that I know that live a little more rural and don't have access to machine shops, They've actually just welded these bad boys back on and <laughs> made it a problem for a later date. So what I'm doing now is I'm turning down all of the spline that was already damaged. And I'm going to make sure, really, really sure, that this is going to be straight all the way across. Because I'm going to take this bar here and I'm actually going to make a collar that goes over top. This bar is 1045 steel, which can be hardened reasonably hard and it'll actually work hardened as it goes. Hey, also a little side note, if you're interested in how the rotary phase recruiter works, I'm going to do a little walkthrough on it, and that's going to be a video that's going to be up and coming here pretty quick. So, as always, we're going to want to face this part off here, because if we don't face this part off, our center drill might start to walk around, and we're not going to get absolute dead center where we want it. Now, as for drilling, I'm actually going to drill three or four thou undersized for what we're looking for, because I'm actually going to heat this part up a little bit later, and we're going to shrink fit it on top. Hey, and a really big thank you to ARW. He sent me out a spreadsheet. And on this spreadsheet, it gives me calculations for how many splines per outside diameter to calculate. Now, I didn't need it on this job here specifically because I'm literally copying another one, but it was a really, really big help because later on down the road, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna need to do something like this without having an original part to copy off of. And it would be pretty sweet to have that. Now that we got that hole drilled, we're going to turn the outside diameter probably about an eighth of an inch oversized from what we need. The reason for this being quite a bit oversized is pretty simple. Once we heat this up with a torch, we're probably going to distort the metal a little bit and we don't want <laughs> we don't want to have it kind of wobbly wobbly on size because there's no way we'd be able to clean it up. Now, I also know what a few of you guys are thinking. I'm probably breaking the rule of the three to one. You know, like for every inch of diameter, you only can have three inches sticking out. I've got a bar in there and it's probably about two feet long. So as long as I'm running at the right speed and I don't hit that frequency, I'm usually pretty okay. I mean, this is a one inch bar. It's gonna be pretty hard to bend. But in saying that, it probably wouldn't have hurt to throw that tailstock in there just to hold it all together. So now that we got her on size, you know, roughly, we can probably start cutting a bit of a shank down on this. Now, the reason for cutting this shank down is pretty simple. I'm going to heat that up pretty hot. Actually, in the grand scheme of things, I probably overheated a little bit, but no big deal. It still works in the end. And I don't want all that heat to kind of conduct down into the chalk and away from the work. So that's why I'm turning this down at a bit of a funny angle. And I didn't turn it the whole length, in case I didn't mention that in the first place, because you want to work from unridged to rigid. If you want something to be super accurate or reasonably accurate, you want it more rigid rather than less rigid. Now, if I had turned this whole length down here, I think over the two or three inches, it would have been wobbling at the end over all over the place. Now, I'm just gonna take a small dry run at this to see if it's gonna line up and everything is gonna go. And it really wants to go in there for sure. But experience has taught me numerous times always to check the length on anything you're doing and double and triple check it <laughs> because there's nothing worse and pushing a part into something and then not being able to get it out or spending the rest of the day cutting it out of there. I'm pretty sure this has happened once or twice. Now, experience has taught me that if you're gonna heat something up, you wanna heat it up evenly. And that's why I've got the lathe running at a low speed. Personally, I'm not really worried about covering the wave myself because I'm not really, not really doing any cutting or anything. And even though I do overheat this, like I said, this is gonna offer up a really cool heat transfer. You're actually gonna, it's almost like a, it's almost like a physics lesson from high school. You're actually gonna see this do some heat transfer through con conduction, that's correct, conduction 
from one part to the other. Now, check this out. And in case you're wondering why I heated that up, I'm pretty sure most of you know why, but I'm going to explain to you anyways why we did that. Things expand when you heat them up. Now, necessarily, I didn't need to heat it up that hot, but in the end, what I did was I expanded that part through heat, and then it contracted around the other one, shrink fitting it on top. All right, now that we got that cut off of the hacksaw, we're gonna kind of do some explo exploratory machining here. Now, deep inside there, there's a bit of a pocket that was left when I pushed this all together. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna me measure twice and cut once. And we're basically just gonna cut the end of that off there, just in a rough way, just so that we can find the tip. And then once we found the tip, we're basically going to bring the edge of that collar right up to the tip, and we're going to call that good. <laughs> I think that's one of the bonuses, because I'm a millwright and machinist by trade, right? the two sides kind of battle every once in a while. You see, the millwright side of me always wants production, and sometimes things don't necessarily need to be as accurate as the machinist side of me wants. I find that I kind of get bogged down sometimes, you know, shooting for like specific exact sizes when in the grand scheme of things, it's a shift lever on a bike. And if it's 10 thou too short or 10 thou too long, the grand scheme of things, no one's really going to notice. In fact, the end customer is going to be pretty stoked. But I'll tell you here what does matter is these diameters. <laughs> and these diameters are important. So we're going to make sure we get these right. So if you're getting anxious and you want to see this get welded up, um, there's only one step that I'm going to say, 740 by the way is where I'm going to start welding. There's only one step left and I'm just going to cut some V-grooves in the end of this and I'm going to cut some V-grooves in the side of it because i got to fill those V-grooves in with weld. You see, if I welded just on the surface of this, it, it, I can guarantee you it wouldn't have held on as well. I mean, it is shrink fit on there, but it's not going to hold on quite as well as if you throw a weld on there as well. And that's why I'm going to grab this V-bit and I'm going to jam it into that collar there. This is really a testing to actually how well this shrink fit actually worked because <laughs> if, if this was just a press fit, I would have probably had some spinach already by now. And that, <laughs> and that would have ended in a lot of sadness and heartbreak. Let's zip out to the shop and let's throw some welds down and see how it's going to look. Now, out in the welding shop, I've got the welding positioner, and man, this welding positioner is worth its weight in gold, I'm telling you right now. I mean, we all know how it ends when you weld in the lathe, you're going to mess up the bearings. I mean, out in the field, I have seen some people kind of hook the ground and then <laughs> run it reverse and then run it forward and weld, but I don't recommend that <laughs> whatsoever. Now, to prevent this from actually spattering on the shaft, I kind of came up with this on the fly. Now. I've got cooking oil that I stole from the wife from the kitchen. <laughs> and in the end, actually, this cooking oil stops the spatter from sticking onto the shaft. And I mean, I know there's a product out there that you can buy, but this actually worked quite well for it. And actually, my shop smelled pretty good when we were done welding. So just to give you a heads up, it might look like I'm just jumping on here and welding it like, <laughs> welding it like a boss. But I probably spent about 30, 40 minutes welding the same diameter shaft <laughs> from the scrap drawer, of course, just to make sure I got it right so that the first time I sent it around, it looked good like it did here. Now, I'm just going to spot weld this just in little places here, there, and everywhere, making sure I get deep penetration down into that shaft. Okay, back out of the cold side shop and into the warm back shop. Now, this is where the really fun part of the project really, <laughs> really starts is kind of turning it down to the actual actual dimension from after we welded it. And this weld turned out quite well, and I'm, I'm very happy with it. I mean, it always could be a little bit better, but I played with my heats, heats and speeds, or feeds and speeds, quite a bit on it, and I got it as cool as I possibly could. Now what I'm gonna do is to get my measurements, I'm gonna to touch off on that side shoulder there, I'm gonna zero it, and then I'm gonna measure off that other part that I have, and make these lengths pretty close to the end dimension that we're looking for. And remember the lengths aren't overly too important because it, it is just a shifter knob and we're just going for looking right, not being exactly right. But what does really matter is that outside diameter. Hey, now that we got that length worked out, 
let's move on to the outside diameter. Now, the first step I'm going to take here for doing the outside diameter is pretty obvious. I've got a really rough outside because I, I put some heat to it with the torch and then we welded it. So it's going to be a little bit warped in some ways. So we're going to take a skim cut here and just check to see what we're actually working with here. Now, if you listen to that, you can actually hear it cutting and then not cutting, cutting and then not cutting. Let's turn this off and let's have a quick look at what we're working with here. And then we can probably see the pattern. Now, just this momentary spin down, you actually see a dark spot and a light spot. And that tells me I gotta go a little bit, a little bit deeper on this before we can actually start measuring the outside diameter. And you'll know when I take this cut here in a second here, you'll actually know because you don't hear that squawking noise on and off, on and off again. And it'll feel a little bit smoother on the handles of the machine as well. Once you've got to cutting the full diameter, and you don't have the egg shape anymore. I, I often tell my kids when they're running machines that you have to listen to the machine sing. Most of the time the machine's singing a happy song, and when it's not singing a happy song, <laughs> and it's singing a sad song, you need to find out the reason why it's singing the sad song. Sometimes it might be something out around, sometimes it might be because you're going too slow or too fast. <laughs> Kind of like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You want to find that in between so that that machine starts singing that happy song again. Usually it's something simple that can be fixed easily by supporting something or changing the angle of something. Sometimes it's even a dull tool bit. And this is where you gain experience when you, <laughs> when you come across these mistakes. And even an experienced person like myself, and even people more experienced than me, we're still learning. And the minute you stop learning, you're not actually going forward anymore. You're actually going backwards. Because much like learning is to a man that is listening, if a man's always talking, I guess I'm talking right now, but if a man's always talking, he's never learning anything because he's not taking anything in. And going out into the field, you're going to make mistakes. And you got to remember that making mistakes is learning. And, <laughs> and sometimes when you're learning, it's uncomfortable. And now we've hit that outside diameter, and that's exactly what we're looking for. This knurling tool, speaking of what we're looking for, is perfectly what we're looking for. It has the same profile as that spline on the motorcycle, and I have a strong feeling that if we roll this with the same dimension, we're going to get the exact same part, and this is probably how they make it in the factory. I mean, could you, could you imagine cutting one of these by hand with an indexing machine? It would take you forever. Also, side note, if you notice how I'm hooking this up here, the third bolt down is actually a backing bolt on this knurling tool, and then there's only actually the two front bolts you see there are actually holding it. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spin this turret over, and I'm actually gonna look in between there, and I wanna get an even gap in there. And now that I have the even gap in there, I'm gonna throw this ruler in here, and we're gonna set our height. Now, if we have our height perfectly set right, that ruler is gonna be straight up and down. If you want to know more about knurling, actually, check out some of my other knurling videos. I've actually go a little bit more into depth than what I'm doing here. And there's actually some really fun projects that I work on. Now, there's a bit of learning in here. I'm going to take a little test knurl on this. And then I'm going to look up real close at it. And you can actually see the pattern working evenly there, the full width of that knurling tool. Now, this means that I'm actually parallel with the work which is important because if you're not parallel, it's gonna be putting more pressure on one side than the other. Now, my dimension is actually gonna be a little bit out here. It's actually gonna be a little bit bigger. Now, I can actually tell this because it's gonna double knurl here. Normally, you would pick it up perfectly on the first round, but for some reason, it's almost like a half a tooth out. And when I stop this, you're gonna see what I'm talking about here. it's actually double knurled, okay? So it's actually a finer tooth pitch than what's on the tool. So what I'm gonna to do to overcome this, and I don't, I don't know if this works in all cases, but I'm just gonna run this over a few times back and forth, and it's actually gonna cut down the diameter of this. I have a feeling this is only gonna work for a single point knurling tool, like a straight knurl, not the crosshatch type. What's actually happening here in the process, when I stop it here, you can actually see shavings kind of shaved off from the top of this. And then I'm gonna tighten this up one more time, and then we're actually gonna start to see it start to cut in the correct manner that we're looking for. The 
see when I stop it here, I can actually see the pattern developing correctly. This is what led me to believe that I should just push a little harder in and then check to see the work. See now, it's starting to work and I'm going to work my way across here. Now, I'm actually having some of the chips kind of shave off from there and it's working its way back into the work. So I'm going to have to grab something, clean off all these shavings, and come back and continually do that to make sure that they're not beating themselves back in there. We get a good product in the end. Now, I don't have the coolant system set up on the lathe because I, I generally don't use a coolant system when I'm machining. I probably should. And that would probably wash away a lot of these little parts. I thought to myself at first, you know, I should throw some cutting oil on there. Perhaps that'll wash away the chips. And then it kind of came to me, scotch bright. Now, Scotch-Brite not only is going to pick up these shavings and carry them away, but it's also going to actually kind of clean off the top burrs in there and give me the product that I'm looking for. Let's polish this up and have a closer look at this. Now, I'm Pretty happy with that actually, this is turning out quite well. I think we're gonna run this over one more time just to make sure that we got a good cut in there and kind of to grind out some of those patterns that we didn't really appreciate in there and give us the final dimension that we're looking for. We want this, <laughs> we want this a work of art for the customer, right? And speaking of work of art, it's looking damn good if I don't say so myself. Now, there's only one left thing that we have to do. And that's to cut that kind of half round in the center of this. That's where the bolt's gonna go through to tighten up that spline that goes over top of it. If you don't quite know what I'm talking about, let me grab the part and I'll show it up close and it'll make a little bit more sense for you. See, this is the bolt that's gonna go through there. And if you look through there, that bolt actually kind of touches the shaft there if I wouldn't have cut that groove out in there. So let's grab something similar diameter and cut this groove out of there. And actually, here's a good learning moment for you here. I'm going to line this up in the center here. And you see that tool bit that I have in there? It has quite a bit of a rake on it. It was used for a different job. Now, because of that quite a bit of rake, only half that tool is sitting on center or below center and the other part's above it. So you only see it's only cutting on the left-hand side, which is a problem, right? So let's back this out and get the height set up correctly and then see what the consequences of having the correct height set up. Yeah, that's cutting a <laughs> that's cutting a little bit more kind of what we're looking for here. Guess there's only one more thing left to do. Let's let's grab this shifter fork and put it on here after we polish this up. And see how it fits up. Now keep in mind, if you do decide to do one of these, you actually remember you have to pry that shifter fork apart because it's been clamped down and it was clamped down on the other part that of course was ruined and smaller. I'm just gonna lightly tap this a little bit further on here. There was a few little burrs that were holding me up, but in the end, this bolt's gonna go in just perfect and I'm very happy with the end product of this. Let's take it out and have a look at it. Man, this looks really good and I'm pretty stoked on how it worked out. This is the one that I made here. And this is actually another one that was given to me as well, just to size up some of the dimensions. I think this project turned out quite well and I'm glad you liked the video. And here's another video I think you're really gonna like. We'll catch you on the next one.